Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the January 12th, 2021 DevOps Lunch and Learn discussion was all about uh, taking down Parler and the first uh, amendment, set to Section 230, broader uh, service provider implications, uh, and, and issues related to that. And these are tricky, thorny issues that we think are going to continue to evolve. So, you know, please listen in, think about uh, how technology companies are responsible for the content that they provide, if they should be, what they should do if they have issues, and what the impacts are going to be, and who do we hold accountable for content uh, and comments and actions online uh, that violate laws. That's a very real conversation. Please join us at the2030.cloud if you have thoughts about this. We want to hear from you. Thanks. Some of the the stuff coming out about Parler, I just find just hmm. everything to do wrong in developing a cloud app. <laughs> How so? I so I haven't heard anything about the the tech. I've only heard about and and that they got pushed out of Amazon, but I haven't heard anything oh, about the actual the, the tech is is some of the most poorly architected, constructed, written uh, software you could imagine. Like the um, Twitter and other folks strip all the metadata out of photos and compress them. Parlor yeah. leaves everything in. So some, some tech, techie woman uh, yesterday started, or two days ago, started uh, scraping the site for all of the January 6th stuff. And when she found out that they were going to uh, uh, shut it down on Amazon, she continued the scraping. Okay. And all of the videos, all of the uh, pictures have geolocation, have full IDs of the people who took it. And Parler requires a lot more information provided by the user before you get your account. So they're fully identified with location, timestamp, everything. Huh. And she she scraped 54 terabytes of data. She got 99.9% .9 of, of Parler. And it may include deleted stuff too because right. of the way Parler handles deleted uh, messages and texts, which they don't delete. They just hide. <laughs> oh, wow. So I, it's just, it, it's really ugly. <laughs> I hadn't even, I hadn't even thought about, yeah, it makes sense that, that the metadata, that a lot of that stuff is stripped and then minimized and things like that from a, just paying for the amount of bandwidth to send all that. It's material. That's probably a very naive uh, implementation of uh, social sites. I well, they. <laughs> I don't think they were quite expecting to get that big. I'm curious that they that they collect more more data. Um, I I had th thought of them as as an anonymous more of an anonymizing site, but no, they not. they okay. actually um, they're not an anonymizing site. They're just a site that doesn't that uh, claims that they do less uh, less oversight. And they were thrown together quickly by uh, at I think they they grabbed somebody's tech. They essentially took a, a small startup and said, "Okay, we need to get this up fast." And similar oh. to the DNC okay. um, uh, caucus software, it was kind of like once you just say we're going to do it. And, and tell the team, the team doesn't have to be particularly talented. They just answer uh, feature requests and who cares what it looks like underneath. We talked about Parler? Yeah. yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, it definitely is one of those, it, they, they weren't, my, my understanding is they were been around for a couple of years. It wasn't. It wasn't a new site, but they certainly didn't have the growth. They didn't. They, that they're. That they're. <laughs> oh no! It it had been around for a, for a couple of years for sure. Um, not 
elegant in terms of what the system architecture looked like. Um, did you guys touch on the data mining that happened before Parlo went offline? We were just talking about that. that oh, okay, all right, right. That the photos and videos had the metadata. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That was some strong work that that woman did. I mean, we're presuming that's a woman. <laughs> yeah, and everything I heard also said it was a woman. Yep. Uh, and yeah, she if ninety nine point nine percent of of uh, everything on the site. She collected ninety nine. She captured that much of their infrastructure. Yep. Well, of their content. Of their content. Uh, my guess is. My guess is like about a that. breach in itself, but. Well, my guess is that ninety nine point nine percent is is more of a her not claiming 100% because there might be new data after the scrape. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the 99.9% could be within, you know, a certain epoch because she was trying to write more relevant, more expensive data was the one that was, you know, within certain um, time scopes of Jan 6th, right? That was the most pressing relevant, quote unquote, true data. Yeah, you could go further back Right, but the further oh, back you go, the data ages out. Right, and she did go further back. Oh um, yeah, like absolutely. Right, I mean, if, if the point was to harvest and mine data, that we, about, we sure. just lost you. Right. Yeah. Not Some kind of a timeline on. of orchestration coordination. Um, yeah. You know what the motives were of the folks that were showing up there. Absolutely, it makes complete sense. But you know, the reason I think that this is probably a known person in you know, fellow traveler circles is because she was able to recruit help from others, right? Whether that was to mirror sites that she was worried about, if you know, hers might get DDoSed or um, you know, somebody mm -hmm. might come in and destroy. Um, and she needed multiple ingestion streams, uh, so. Yeah, she definitely was well connected within mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. the tech community. Yeah, just, you know, somebody random telling me, hey, can you help me start streaming Parla data out for <laughs> posterity reasons? Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to stay up two nights just working for them. <laughs> if to I don't be fair, know, to I don't be fair though, the, the White Hat community is very well connected. Oh, absolutely. And they have a very big network that, that they can mobilize fairly quickly. There was, mm -hmm. a, there was a fairly recent article about... Uh, an issue with one of the the blockchains that required them to mobilize a, a, a effectively a, a large mining network in order to safeguard some third party's data uh, on the data. I'll see if I can find it. It's, it was a very interesting read. Another thing that I find fascinating is that once Parler went down, the highest downloaded app on Android and Apple became parlor p-a-r-l-o-r <laughs> hopefully somebody's selling us uh, furniture yeah everybody or... everybody's showing up at rob's house for a massage <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anybody about my side businesses please that's a possible whitehouse.com moment there <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant when they did that. Yeah. God, internet's a crazy place. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So, does anyone have Go ahead. questions about or concerns about the reaction of the tech world in shutting down sites like Parler and? And, and, and what that means from a data protection or a data rights perspective. Um, have, we, have, we, have we hit that thing where, you know, I'm always concerned about things that are done for right reasons also can be doing things done for wrong reasons. What's the, what's the kind of community's opinion on that? I can give you my opinion on it. And uh, this is something I tweeted out recently as well. Um, I. A, I don't think it's a First Amendment issue to begin with because this was, you know, the, the, the common now known reason that this was a private entity just deciding on their own. But where people are getting a little bit concerned is that it happened 
what seems like a coordinated effort between Facebook, Google, Apple, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and that, even if it was coordinated, A, I don't contend it was, but even if it was coordinated, this is exactly how you would expect somebody to behave, right? There's a reaction that happens in the market and you could have multiple players. You could have JPMC, Goldman, all reacting to the same clear flare yeah. signal sign that goes up. So, you know, A, I don't think it was coordinated, but even if it was, these are just everybody acting out of self-interest saying that what Parler is doing, what Trump did, is destabilizing democracy, which we need as a market fundamental, right? If all of us are beneficiaries for in this market economy, what these guys are doing, they're destabilizing it, they're bringing in fascism, which hurts all of us. So this, this wasn't you know, a First Amendment issue, this wasn't curbing down on unorthodox thought issue, this wasn't you know, censoring conservative opinion issue, it was just on a market capitalist, right? They are gonna hurt me. If we end up in this fascist world that Trump is creating, it hurts all of us. That's it. To me, it's as simple as that. Everything else is freaking navel grazing right now. I, I agree that uh, it, I, I don't see it as, as being a, a coordinated action. I, I see it more as the, the market players all having the same thresholds for removing an, an application or, or service that they, they, see, they deem to be harmful. Uh, the, the fact that the, the magnitude of this particular event, uh, it probably triggered a wide band of thresholds. Uh, so it, 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 it looked like they all decided to do this at the same time because they had the same trigger. Yeah, but you know, if it was just out of uh, pure, uh, you know, uh, graciousness of their hearts, you know, this uh, I don't think it was uh, out of some virtuous threshold that all of a sudden Trump crossed. It was just that's what it looks like when you overturn a duly elected president, when you overturn democracy. That has to be threatening to every market player. And you just go, no, I'm, I'm not going to go down that path. If this is what happened, like, give me an instance of a fascist authoritarian state where market capitalism actually works. Out of self-interest, I'm perfectly okay with that. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it, 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 it was self-interest. It wasn't selflessness. Yeah. If you follow things like uh, EFF, and Euro EU disinformation and things like that, folks pretty much, uh, most of those folks said, yay, and let's just be careful out there that we don't allow it to uh, quash things that need to be out there. So, yeah, but you know, e EFF, it has been historically, they have been known to be very ideologically driven as well, right? They don't always make the right calls. Um, well, yes. I, I've I worked with them, I've worked against them. <laughs> um, uh, ultimately, I, I mean, beyond whether whether they were right or, or, or wrong to, to remove partner, which, which is a different dis discussion, I, I, I think that the the part that is more interesting to us here is to see um, how concentrated the control is over the over the ability to publish a platform. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes. So, so that that is literally what what we were discussing last week. Yeah. Uh, like, who controls the cloud? Uh, and, and this shows, like, in twenty twenty one. These are the, the, the players that control the cloud. Yep. So and in that particular sense, the gatekeepers end up being the ones that are manning the last mile. In this case, it's owning the handset OS, right? This is Google Android and Apple iOS. Those two. You can move to any cloud. You could go to a hosted solution. But unless you come up with you know some underlying, I mean, you could run this on signal protocol on a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? Bring up a social network site. Uh, entirely peer-to-peer -peer underneath, you could use signal protocol. But then it's, if you're doing that, right, it's 
it's not a sustainable revenue model for anybody who actually wants to do this. To make yeah. it a sustainable ad revenue or influencer revenue model, which is what Parlo wanted to do, um, you need it in the hands of people. You need to have metadata collected from the users, uh, harvest data that you can actually either sell to for ad revenue purposes, et cetera, or um, you have ads that show up in line in your timeline. But you know, without metadata, they're not targeted, focused, demographically relevant ads either. So, uh, can it, hmm. you know, yeah. technically architecturally be done outside of AWS? Yeah, it can be, right? AWS, GCP, Azure, you can be, right? Functionally, you can do that, but you know, uh, you got to have somebody with very deep pockets, <coughs> a state like Russia, China, Iran, et cetera, to be able to fund them. <laughs> Wait, yeah, so, take... Well, Parler supposedly- Go ahead, Rocky, Rocky you're quiet. Par Parler has uh, claimed they're moving over to um, the same uh, cloud provider as I think it's Gab, but I also just read while I was doing the search on Twitter about the the data dump is that Parler was running on bare metal, so they were renting bare metal instances at AWS also, which also tells you something about their technical architecture and capabilities. So, but. Yes, and that's why Parler, uh, to Ajit's um, uh, info, you know, the the whole extra info on all the, the Parler members, like he said, they need that information if they're gonna monetize. And so they were collecting more information because they needed to, to monetize the platform. Hey, Rocky. <clears throat> yep. So that comment you made, was that a good comment or a bad comment? Uh, the bare metal? Yeah. Um, so I believe in the case of Parler uh, and from everything I've heard about the software and everything, it's it was essentially a, a, a leg, well, that the, the Parler folks, uh, people say that they've been around for a while and yeah, they've been around for a while. They didn't have until they became the, uh, the, the rights, uh, poster child for for open communications. Yeah. They really didn't have a large team. They didn't have money. They were just close to a shoestring startup. And so they were using legacy. I'm pretty sure all of this is because of legacy techniques. Yeah. A lot of and that's, the they made yeah. was yeah. legacy is what people knew. They could get it up fast. They could manage it fast. And they didn't have the, the bandwidth to actually advance to the more modern uh, tools. Yep. That's what I thought you were getting at. Cause that's, that's actually a pretty interesting perspective. You know how, you know, Rob, he loves his bare metal. <laughs> well, I dude, love bare metal. I do, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't run. Metal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but, I was, but that was what I was curious. Cause I, out of everything she had, she said, that's what I caught. <laughs> because I'm like, I, is because <laughs> I'm like, is that a bad thing? Because it because it tells a lot about a lot of things, right? So that's uh, anyway. I just, I, I yeah. it's it's a strange it's a strange choice to make. It's a really expensive yeah. choice to make in Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. So I'm. I, I can they unload that hardware and move it somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> You know, back a truck up and load it up and move it. The, the other aspect I find interesting <laughs> is because of their choice, and this also talks about how it was a legacy style design, is that it's going to take them, from what I've heard, from what everyone is saying, at least weeks to get back up on another provider. Yeah. And so that also says legacy because they don't have the images. They don't have... Uh, the the scripting and everything to just roll up a new server exactly it's kind of like the hey rocky what was it you did to get that thing to work again <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it, it could also be that that they have all the, all their, their backups in glacier and you know restoring from glacier takes literally days if, if, <laughs> if they have access yeah. to it i mean this this yeah. to me 
oh boy, there's so many issues to plumb here. I, just on the yes. op, just on the op side, <laughs> yeah. If you know, let's 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 say it's not parlor, right? Let's let's say it's something you know, and you can argue how shades of gray parlor is, but you know, somebody um, actually, we have an example from uh, last December because Chef um, got targeted by a ex-employee who took uh, Ruby libraries out of out of circulation because they objected to ice yeah yeah right yep right and and so you could be in a situation where and this I, this is from last week too this you could be in a situation where one service provider in your chain decides that they don't agree with your business on any on any grounds um, and I, I do, you know, it's, it is worth, I, I'm trying to remember who it was that was bringing up the, the challenge. It, somebody could, you know, object to doing business with you for, you know, you, you don't want to sell, sell them a cake. Um, yes. Right. That was, that was the, I think Keith, were you talking about this? This is the, I, I uh, that's where that. I was going. That's yeah. where I was going. And I, and I, and I think someone to mention kind of a, a, a point onto it, but that's where I wanted to go was as so I lead an MSP organization as a managed service provider who leverages automation and works with all of the endpoint providers, both tier one and tier two. Mm -hmm. Could they close down my business because one of my customers happens to be someone who's out of vogue, right? And I, guys, everyone who knows me knows where I stand politically and economically. I'm asking the question from kind of the, the mm -hmm. where does, how do we do this smartly? And how, where, I think this goes back to a conversation we had last week about, you know, what is the right answer in a society where information is, is can light fuel to the fire and how do we ensure that that information is both shared equitably as well as it's honest information? So yeah, let you, me, let me who could, go ahead. Go on. Go ahead. Go well, on. I was gonna say, and who controls the, who controls the lever when it, when it doesn't achieve those things? And I'll back up now. And then what I was gonna say is, obviously everybody knows Keith and I work together at said MSP provider. You know, one of the things that we've we've started talking about, and that's you know, like he's talking about right now, is that if you had, say, you had a bad actor as a as a client, as a customer, that were to run, say, Parlor in this example, if we're an MSP and we're managing that infrastructure, at what level do you become as an MSP at jeopardy of of, of that bad actor? Or is there not a, or is it a non-issue, right? Because if they don't have any governance or anything, let's say that, let's take it to another level of, hey, maybe that, that, uh, that social media platform is not parlor, but it's something else. Mm -hmm. And they don't have governance or whatever, but you're managing the infrastructure. Let's say you're managing, to Rocky's point, maybe we're managing the, the point, deployment of that infrastructure now, if you were one of our customers, we'd be able to move you much quicker than a week. But let's assume that we can. But that's 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 the the, the part I wanted to that is is where does that line of demarcation from an ownership and responsibility come when you're in that model? And this is a lot of this goes back to the the two thirty. Uh, section 230. And mm -hmm. most of the people who want to delete it have no clue what it even says. Uh, but, <laughs> but that is actually what's keeping the doors open on a lot of the providers and whatnot and keeping more, more people out there talking and allowed to talk than if it didn't exist because and all of your the MSPs and and the the cloud providers and everything else 
become liable. And so they stop taking risks. So, I, yeah. And, and to add to that, and sorry, Rob, no, and no, to no, add no. to that, if you're say, say like, like Keith and I are talking about, if that say parlor was one of our customers and, but we ran that platform for them, we would basically have to back up on what AWS said. So that gets into a very sticky situation, at least from my perspective is, Say they they say Parler was one of our customers and we did have them on Amazon. They said, "Nope, you're shut down." Blah blah blah. Now we're at the liberty of, "Hey, do we help get them out of this boat, or do we say, screw you, adios?'" You so know what I mean? I'll, I'll give you a case study going like 20 plus years back. Um, I used to work at AS1, um, BBN. You know, got sold off and you know became level three. Now it's Lumens, etc. But Tier one ISP, one of our largest clients um, in terms of pure revenue, right? Profit margin and revenue was this largest porn company, right? Um, web hosting porn was big, 1997, I'm sure it's freaking even bigger now, but the problem there was because they were our client, they were hosting in our data centers, they were either being blacklisted on the IP block itself um, or they were just being filtered off. So there was just the constant upkeep of managing their infrastructure, whether they were under DDoS or whether they were showing up on blacklist uh, was horrendous, right? Uh, so the first thing we did is we took them out of our pristine block, gave them a, you know, their own particular IP block. So anybody that even wanted to blacklist them, it wouldn't affect the larger aggregate blocks that we had uh, serving our broader customer community. Uh, past that, right, we had to negotiate a very different revenue model with them because of just the sheer upkeep it took. And they were more than happy to throw silly money our way. Uh, so there, we were able to, and that's why I'm calling it a case study, we were able to demark them, even though they were a client, as were all other, all other mainstream clients, customers, we were able to draw this demark between the architecture and the infrastructure itself. Um, I, I don't know if the same applies, um, but again, like I say, you know, if it was on moral grounds that Parler was booted up then, or why like, Trump was booted up, it would have happened a long time ago. This wasn't, there wasn't a moral calculus applied either to you know, chucking Trump off or banning Parler. It's just, this is a media platform that essentially is threatening the viability of all their business models. Um, I, I, I've had silly arguments where people say this is the heckler's veto. You know, they're drawing from like 30 years, 35 years back, Salman Rushdie publishing the satanic verses, right? And other state governments just banning the book itself. Uh, but this wasn't the heckler's veto, right? This wasn't a book that actually said, hey, we don't believe in books and we don't believe in bookshops. Um, that's what Parler was essentially, right? Yes, it's a social media, but it wasn't a communication platform. It was essentially saying, Anything you take for granted, just tear it down, right? Upturn democracy. And now you're calling that, you know, your excuse is, well, open marketplace of ideas. Are you kidding me? Fascism is anything but an open marketplace of ideas. So everybody yeah. threatens says, hold, hold, hold on though, that because, is, because I, I don't think that is what the grounds of the takedowns were. I mean, I'm, I'm, we, can have, we can have a discussion on how to police something like that. No, I, I know they, those weren't the rationales, but you know, what I'm saying is they were completely justified in doing it. Just saying that this is the ideology that's being peddled here. This is what they're really talking about. That's it. You know, we don't need you, right? And then, yeah, you can you know, actually add, it doesn't have to be one reason, right? You can layer other reasons on top and say, well, you know, there are moralistic reasons. They don't have content moderation, et cetera. Sure. Absolutely. But, you know, how long was Parler going on without content moderation on AWS? Why didn't AWS react sooner? <laughs> because, but a AWS doesn't moderate. Well, they, they uh, don't, and, exactly, and, right? And, right, they're, they're, they're an infrastructure provider from that perspective. They're not a content moderator. Yeah, really, they're not any, a content any, moderator. Well, Parler is supposed to be a content moderator, right? So AWS is not a content moderator, neither is Google and Apple. But, you know, they start pulling the plug on this because all of a sudden they realize it's not just, you know, open opinion and open marketplace of ideas. The ideas they're discussing are actually talking about just overturning democracy. 
That's uh, it. Well, they were they were leading they were leading to they were being used to organize violence. Yep. I mean that so, that to me was the, and, the the tipping point for this. I think they've been used that way before. Um, mm -hmm. and well, I have a, that's I have a why. Thought. Go are, ahead, Rocky. The reason they could take it down so fast and still hold themselves up to scrutiny is that their terms of service, AWS's terms of service, were written such that Parler was uh, go, was ignoring their terms of service and so we're, we're breaking the contract. And I think this goes back to the 4chan issue where lots of uh, infrastructure folks put this sort of stuff into their contracts because of the whole 4chan thing about people supporting the insurgency in 4chan. And so contracts were rewritten which actually allowed AWS and any other provider who has uh, contractual language like this to say, no, you're, you can't be on our platform because you're uh, breaking our terms of service. I, and one of the things you're hitting on, I'm interested in your, your take, right? Are, how, to what extent is Amazon private, private company? from that perspective, governed by, it's my servers, I do what I want. Governed by its board of directors. That, yeah. Rob, yeah. Rob, are you trying to distinguish between a utility, like a phone company, versus a service provider? I, I'm, Is that I'm, you going, that, I'm, 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 I'm going towards the public square argument, yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 to me, they're, they're moving closer because of their power and breadth are they moving closer to being a regulated utility, which has rules of the road versus a pure private company that is guided by the board of directors and shareholders? I, I think this is where things get really, really an interesting question from that perspective. Um, because, right, this is, and this is the thing I've been scratching my head listening to for the last several years. Um, where we talk about Twitter and Facebook, you know, and potentially Parler being public squares, um, that you know the media will call it the new public square, if you will. Um, but we don't, we don't, they're not governed as public square um, entities, right? They're not, they're not public, they're not technically public spaces, although they are public spaces. Um, they're more like the locals. The what? Taverns. The local tavern. So all this conversation go on in taverns, but the owner can toss you out. So they're not public squares yet because they're not public. Actually, now, isn't that the yeah. whole point of Section 230? Exactly. That the whole well, point. But that's the point, system. right? So as soon as Amazon kicks somebody off for whatever reason, they are now a publisher. They are no longer a platform under Section 230. And as, as such, as they, they are now moderation. No. Yeah. But except that Section 230 says that no, they're that that they're not liable for those people's speeches, but they also have are allowed to put in their own rules because they are not a utility. They're not regulated, <laughs> therefore they have the freedom to kick people off. Now, if the government came back and did and said that that AWS is a public utility like the phone company used to be and said you have to provide it to people in the outback and with poor connectivity, et cetera, like along those lines and regulated them, that would be a different story. But they're not regulated to the extent that the old Ma Bell was. And once Ma Bell was broken up, the regulation dropped off too the need, the requirement to provide and all that other stuff went away. But so part of, part of my, my thinking on this, and I come back to identity and users a bit, and I also think about uh, broadcast media and, and fair coverage and things like that. 230 is really interesting here. I'm matching when, when Larry has his video, I, I turn on. Um, so, but 
if you if 230 applies, it says that the carriers aren't responsible for the content. And then Greg's point, which is is reasonable, is if the carriers start to make decisions about the content, then it's a slippery slope for how those rules get applied. Um, and I would add a third leg to that stool, which is I don't think that the, there's any meaningful distinction between online and in-person life anymore. That to me is a, is a cloud 2030 type statement. I think that the, the, that the idea that you have an online persona and, a, and a, a physical persona and they aren't the same is completely bogus. And I think the, the sixth just confirmed that, right? It's not, you know, if you're doing things online, you're doing things in, in person, there's no, no difference. But we don't have strong identities online. So we don't, if you can say something online anonymously, but, and, and it's not you. And, and that's the default. Instead of when you say things online, it's the same as walking into a tavern or a library or a public square and making a statement, right? You don't, you don't get anonymity walking into any place. You are, you are, you know, you are you. Um, and so to me, they're, they're all three of these are, they're all intersected circles. Um, so, um, Rob, I just posted this recent blurb. Um, I know Dan really well. Um, he's a local Bostonian, um, but uh, the, the guy that authored the AEI article, but essentially that saying is if you're going to, you know, scream and cry at 2.30 at say AWS and say, well, you know, it applies to them because they're stifling speech. Well, locking them down and, you know, saying that they have an inability to edit that hurts infringes on their freedom of speech. So it, it applies both ways, right? If you can't say you're hurting my speech, well, you're hurting their speech to edit as well. So that's, that's a wrong, wrong, you know, kind of scalpel to apply to this problem. And it's, it's not something recent. It, it has been settled. The only reason now, you know, the discourse has come down this low is because you have an idiot like Trump shouting through the, through the bullhorn and everybody forgets the subtleties of this, right? But when you actually go to legal scholars that do this stuff, um, this has been teased apart several times. <laughs> um, but now just the discourse oh, you is mean, you so mean between you exactly. Between your right to speak something and, and the, you know, if you're at a restaurant, their ability- oh, No, not a restaurant. Right. If, if you're saying that, you know, I, if you're saying that a provider cannot edit content a private company, not a state actor, not a government, you are infringing on their right, right? Their right to edit content, quote unquote, mm -hmm. censure content is the same as freedom of speech. That is a first amendment. If, if government policy or government right. public office comes in and says you cannot moderate or you cannot censure, you're infringing on their right. That's why you can't have any legal laws passed mm -hmm. against saying you can or cannot censure to a those, private company. Those, but, we, but, but those, those, but if you look at a newspaper, right? Newspaper prints editorials. Prints editorials. The right. only thing that the newspapers are, they are liable for, you know, content if it's false or not because newspapers create the content, right? But that, that they're is- the, They're the publisher. They're and, the and publisher this, as opposed mm -hmm. to user generated content. Right, so there's that's the distinction. Who owns? Who's creating the content? Yeah, but so the funny so thing is, is, we've solved this problem. Sorry, yeah. Rob, but the, no, the funny thing is, we you. solved this problem. It's called porn. It's called what? I'm sorry. It's called porn. <laughs> the lessons from porn. We we, we solved this problem. In the think about this. Pornography has rules that govern who can, and then the the because right, you're, you're if you're a service provider like AWS. I'm sure that many of these sites are hosted on AWS. They won't admit it or whatever, but it's because there aren't very few carriers out there that can host this kind of stuff. So it's hosted. So they're not responsible for the content. They provide a service to a customer that provides a service to their customers. Mm -hmm. We put rules, we've settled this issue about how to put rules around content, subjective content like porn to guard it against things that generally acceptable norms like kids shouldn't see it. Right. Um, if it's violent, there are further regulations on top of it. Right. right. And there's, um, there's some and, type of, and, and there's some types that are actually illegal. 
Right. right. And then they, they hold the content provider, not the service provider, but the content provider, the, the person who makes the content, the publisher, I guess, in this case, they make you know, the creator, they make them responsible for anything that violates those rules. I'm wondering, you know, we have celebrated for years the this free trip, this free thing called internet. Technology has reigned free. The internet has been free, virtually unregulated. My my question is because you take it out of the current political situation and insurrection and all that stuff. Let's put it in something that's porn that what that can be objective to some people. We've regulated it. It's still a thriving enterprise. It still exists. Because I, I, I get very concerned on both sides of the fence. And I'm not a libertarian, but sometimes I feel like I'm getting more and more like that in some of these answers, these discussions. And that is, where does free market end and my desire to protect my child from being indoctrinated to something mm. that I feel is offensive, but then that, that desire of mine to protect my child doesn't infringe on someone else's right to speak or to partake in that thing that I deem offensive. Yeah. So, you know, if you can, where does technology fit now? Well, if you can do filtering on your side to protect your child, that's perfectly fine. I I think the, the example you're bringing up about the porn industry here, you know, you go 20 years back again, um, you had accountability, right? Anybody that played foul of rules, whether that was underage kids being abused on porn sites, et cetera, because you had accountability on who was creating content, you could do that, right? Now, when there is user-generated content, this is one of the main reasons where, what, like last month or something, um, and this this shows up in, you know, high scalability blogs, et cetera, when you read, uh, Pornhub chucked um, anybody that wasn't a verifiable um, content producer off their site, right? And the reason they did that is because of this accountability, right? If you come down and sue Pornhub for whatever reason. I mean, they're based out of Montreal, Canada, right? But if you come down and sue them and they can't turn around and say, well, this is the user that we got to chuck and ban. If that, if they don't have uh, the functionality to be able to do that, they don't want to be in that business, right? They're hugely, highly profitable, uh, clearly. Uh, I don't know if they're a publicly traded company or not, but this is one of the big reasons where all of a sudden they said, yep, if we don't have verifiable users that are generating content, you're no longer on our platform. That's it. You're gone. So do, do, if you have the same accountability on social sites, uh, whether that's parallel, when you have strong identities, um, you know, it gets you halfway, halfway there to solving the problem, right? True identities. Yeah, you can have personas if you're like on a gaming site or something and you want to play, I don't know, an elf or something. That's that's something else, right? Spinning up personas on where you don't have identity that can be traced back to you. Um, that is what really opens you up. Like half the problems are solved if you have strong authenticated identity on, on websites, I, on social media I forms. I very strongly agree with you because of how much we've intersected internet life and, and physical life. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing, and to me that that accountability is part of how, of part of how we would, um, you know, make, you know, basically converge the technical, technical life and the internet with, with what we're doing. If, if, if you're lying, slandering, right. Inciting, then, then those are things that we would hold people, you know, organizing to organizing for violence, all those things we would just, you know, if, if we can, the veil is thinner or non-existent yep. then um i i think that's a good thing an interesting question when i've heard that argument and i i 100 i, I strongly agree I've, I've made that argument a long long time and i think it's important you turn around to a place like china where mm-hmm. they're crashing down dissent i mean they are i guess they already do this there is no there is no privacy there um the, the, in order to have that, the ability to govern and protect people on the other side of that is going to have to be really important, right? I, I was thinking the other day, like we used to publish people's names and phone numbers in a book that was available like on every corner. And I can't imagine what that would be like in today's world. 
Yeah, because you can play foul, right? Even yeah. if I choose to be uniquely identified, verifiable identity in my phone number, et cetera, because there is in technical architecture, there's room for abuse where I can mask somebody else's SIP ID, et cetera, and start, you know, phone bombing you. Um, and that's, because yeah, and that's, that that's, a, that's a, and that's a travesty of how we've built these technical systems that allow mm -hmm. for that type of anonymity. The idea that I can get unidentified calls. Yep. It, it's unidentified unknown. calls or masked calls, right? I can mask somebody else's, uh, I have a SIP server running and I can mask mm -hmm. your phone number, Rob. But, <laughs> but then go yeah. back to the days when we had those books with people's names and phone numbers. Those were also the days where we had no visibility into even the number that was calling us when, when uh, the phone rang. Technology right. opened us up to knowing more about this stuff. And now we can't even conceive of not having that information. But back in the day, it's the phone rang, you answered it. And it could be someone you knew, it could be someone you didn't know, it could be sales, it could be a wrong number, but you don't even find out until you actually have a physical conversation across that line. Yeah. No, no. Absolutely, because in the old, quote unquote, the olden days, it was actual circuit switching, your actual phone number. Here, what a SIP server essentially does with VoIP, it just has that binding uh, because it's not needed to complete the call, right? It's destination-based routing, actually all of internet, when you're talking about voice over IP, it's all destination-based routing. So even if you're able to do reverse path verification on the IP layer, unless you take that back and say, well, is this source route bound to this phone number, right? Um, and that's just too costly to implement, right? Just reverse path verification on the IP layer, IPv4, IPv6, that is costly. So technologically, yes, with SIP and VoIP, um, it is permissible, right? It's out of courtesy, uh, it's not needed, it's not required, out of courtesy that the one receiving the call gets to see your phone number, uh, the source phone number. It's nowhere needed in the protocol but, at all. Yeah, but but without uh, with a uh, pull up from the the tech a little bit, I'm trying to think through. Would the world like would the the, the, the what we just lived through, mm -hmm. right? Um, where you know even if we knew all the speakers, um, and maybe this is this is going into there, there's no where does it does that change accountability that people mispresenting things that aren't true. Um, I mean, the First Amendment's going to allow you to say just about anything you want in these circumstances, identified or not. I mean, we could say, hey, hey, you're, you're saying a whole bunch of stuff I disagree with, or you're saying a whole bunch of stuff that are lies. Um, yeah, if you have even just because you have a set, a subset of people that are okay with clear identity, spouting off nonsense fucking trump does it all the time right everybody knows who he is everybody knows he lies um, yeah. just because you have these a set of people that do this doesn't mean there is a majority in that same set that knowing that they have to stand behind what they say uh, they just won't say it so again right it's not outright solving entirely solving the problem but you know it gets you you know well on your way through um the other, the, it's left up to the platforms, right? Where they say, if you're actually pushing content on, um, we have to know who you are. But that's, this is true, valid, applicable in this state under the US Constitution and this open democracy. When you bring up the case of China, uh, yeah, exactly. That does not apply, right? accountability where people actually need to be anonymized, they need to revolt because just, you know, the state power is such that they'll come after you. Uh, clearly this doesn't apply. Uh, and you don't need to change the tech stack much. You just need to make sure anonymity is added in. Again, for communication protocols, if you need some anonymity, um, not just, you know, uh, data and flight encrypted, et cetera, we're talking about source destination anonymity, right? You want some peer to peer, you need, you know, over tour. Uh, sure, that's perfectly fine. Um, but that's not a marketplace of ideas, right? Where those two are merging is something like signal where you actually have, 
or you can build or signal you can build a peer to peer mesh, you can, you know, further abstract out the true identity itself. And if you were to build a social network on that, yeah, now you have a larger problem, right? Try solving for that in a couple of years, uh, <laughs> what you just did with Parler. Yeah, inter interestingly, if they'd architected Parler as a peer-to-peer -peer system, then they wouldn't be. They could, and you know, then then uh, the, the the big thing right now was the gatekeepers being Android, Google, and Apple iOS. How do you get around the gatekeepers, right? And there is a way to do that, right? But and it would it would be very hard to start filtering that if you were to do that. Well, but we'd we'd also be back in the day where everybody could. Um, everybody could just write an app and they would, you know, hack your phone. Right. I mean, I, I was using cell phones and items like that. You could double click on something, and install an app on your phone. And, you know, if you weren't careful, it, it would, you know, download all your data and corrupt your phone. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, Google and, and Apple exist the way they do. Not, not because that was their design originally. It was, it was a, a recovery of, of, you know, security, right? Um, uh, I it's 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 chilling because I I feel like there's these are things that we need to address and solve, and some of the solutions to me end up um, only entrenching the pro making the problems worse, right? Further entrenching the power of. Um, Speaking of oh yeah, that that right. That that's why you say right. Without muddling things, yes, there is a problem with consolidation of actors um, in the space that does need to be addressed for sure. Um, but in this particular case, booting Trump or you know banning Parler, um, that I personally don't think that's that's a case of well. First Amendment issue or 230, um, but that's again, personal opinion. Um, I've been trying to defend it the last couple of days. <laughs> well, with Trump, it's pretty much a case of shouting fire in a theater. So you have a right to, to uh, censor that sort of speech. Oh yeah, but you know, it, it, he's, been, he's been shouting for the last freaking five years, six years, right? Yeah, well, it, at least uh, Twitter and, and Facebook finally decided that that he was actually creating uh, an instance of, of danger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Took him long enough. <laughs> and this goes back to, to Jeet, what you were saying earlier, like w whether to, they were morally right or, or wrong to, to censor Parler. Um, and, and yeah, just like what you're just saying, like, I, I don't think we can say that they were, they were either morally or, or ethically wrong to, to censor them for the reasons that we already discussed. Uh, it, it, it was surprising. It, it would be a, a better uh, discussion to, to say or to, to ask, were, would, were they morally or ethically wrong to wait this long before making that decision yeah but you know th this is where you can actually make that uh slippery slope claim that you know you we have ideological differences etc this is where you can actually go down that rabbit hole whether you know so far were they ethically morally wrong or you know aws knew that parlo was being hosted there the, the the case that i'm making which is a very easy to reason with is this is the bookshop that decided to throw out books purposely advocated burning down the fucking marketplace. I'm, if I'm a bookshop owner, I say, yeah, I don't want these books. I don't want to, you know, not just I don't want them. I don't want them being showcased outside my bookshop that actually advocate for burning down the marketplace. Oh, yeah, That's please. what Parler was doing. It was talking about interaction and taking over the capital. And in that instance, I agree with it where I get concerned because the power of technologists, and this goes back to my whole premise, which is ethical technologists, where, because we are so powerful, 
because we can bring down the world with a phone, taking liberty with Rob's statement. Do we have an ethical, moral responsibility as technologists, as part of this DevOps community? Do we have a moral ethical responsibility to be one, concerned about the decisions we make and two, start to have open conversations about if not rules of the road, at least technological barriers that can should not be crossed. And if crossed, there's penalty to be to be distributed among anyone participating uh, in. I I think we do right. It's the age old question of moral philosophy, right? You could stay by you know either nihilistic principles that you know, you're all in it, like nothing matters, or you could have libertarian tendencies that I'm responsible only for myself. Or you could have a more ethical moral code that talks about maximum benefit to, mo to, to most. Um, if what I am doing, if you're an MSP, right, is bringing a client on board into your infrastructure, um, not just for your particular reason, right? Is it hurting more of your own clients where you say, yeah, this is, uh, you'd make that own calculus. Mm -hmm. what, to serve this one client hurts 50, other, 50 of my other clients. Um, you could stick to it and say, no, I'm being extremely principled and they all have a right. Yeah, that's, that's what is legislated, but past legislation, you have to be able to say, it actually is hurting the viability of the ecosystem, which allows me to have 49 other clients that I have to serve. Well, it goes beyond that, though. It's not just capitalism. It, it's capitalism. It's the Oppenheimer conundrum, the nuclear bomb. And so as scientists, it's a cool experiment. As members of society, uh, not so cool. So it's the conundrum of where you sit both in as a technologist and a member of a civil society. And there are lots of folks who don't consider themselves part of a civil society who still access your technology. Yeah, there's the, it's, you're not gonna hit a hard D mark between, you know, uh, having just championing individual rights versus rights of a society at large, right? Somewhere that slight bar is in the middle um, and everybody ends up running their own calculus. Legislation ends up being more or less, you know, a hard D mark, but um, if you're an MSP, it's entirely up to you what content you wanna host. Um, and I see AWS as a service provider as well, right? Yes, I get it. They are a monster in the space. And uh, that's the only reason why all of these discussions are happening that, you know, I was AWS that chucked them out, right? If this was a mom and pop shop ISP around the, around the corner that decided to chuck somebody off because they found their content offending, this wouldn't be a new story. So because yep. there is this consolidation of power and oh. AWS is a primary, primary service provider, um, that is why this is an issue, right? Um, Parler can try their best and say, hey, you know, we'll try and move on to Azure, but you know, what are the odds that Azure will say yes to it? No, they won't. The only, the only way you get away from it is to be able to entirely decentralize, distribute the essential responsibility, the liability on not one provider and you end up with something that's peer to peer. Right, have a completely decentralized social network. Was, I um, mean, we have we have strong, we actually have really strong peer to peer file sharing and, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Perspective, and it's designed actually to circumvent government controls because it's you know sharing of media that would exactly otherwise, so in, otherwise violate two thirty sections, right? Yep. So in, in for technical for technical architectural reasons, there's nothing that stops the next parlor from spinning up as a peer to peer. The catch still would be right, you're not dependent upon a service provider, the catch would be again, the gatekeepers of the last mile, right. So you can't you may maybe you don't need an app, right? Maybe this is just going to be like any other HTTP code, open it up through a browser, but then you know, what stops Safari or Mozilla from actually doing client 
like a thin client browser client filter filtering mm. that can be done. I, all right. And we're, yeah. we're out of time. I, this, yeah. this to me needs more thought because I, 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 I don't think we've come even close to having a reasonable test. <laughs> to Keith's point. Um, we're there, ha you know, either we're going to be free for all and, and let it go, or we're going to, you know, there needs to be something in the middle. Um, and it has to be something we can understand. And, and so what you have is there are a few pundits out there, tech, technology pundits that are claiming this is the inception point for decentralized web, uh, distributed web, because now these folks have to go and do it with distributed apps and they're out there. But again, the team that ran Parler and built Parler don't have the bandwidth or the capability to move to the distributed app quickly, at least. They might be able to do it in a few months, but uh, that's why they're looking for yeah. uh, a cloud provider that, or even just a data center that will give them access. But uh, I guess Balaji has been really shouting the whole inception point uh, for distributed web. And so what happens when it all goes distributed? Le less control, more libertarianism, as some people view libertarianism, and less civil society or more civil society. So back to what Ajit is saying, we, and Rob is saying, we've got a lot further to dig into this to, uh, if we look towards the future. And so 2030, uh, distributed I, web. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think the, the, topic we're discussing is going to have bigger um, repercussions than we are anticipating from a tech perspective. So, all right, everybody, I appreciated this discussion. It wasn't what I was expecting. I would start the, the, the lunch conversation with, but uh, it really made me think, and I always appreciate that. So thank you all. Um, we'll probably have similar conversation on Thursday. Um, and then, oh, uh, I'm going to do one-on-ones if people are interested um, thinking about the 2030 conversation. I was hoping to do 30 minutes of what individuals thought about it. Um, sure. And well, it's not, I know some people were not happy with that conversation or thought we missed things or didn't, didn't think about it. So I want to turn those into uh, thought pieces. On top of that, if we with this parlor thing and whatnot in the distributed web, you know, you might want to give folks a, a week or so to 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 ingest what's been going on this past week, because that's going to change a lot of perspective on 2030, like you said. I think it will too. Thank you all. Got to run. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>